We know America likes to spend on the military and stuff, but the real reason why the US Navy has 11 aircraft carriers. Let's see why they have so many, what's the reason for it, and uh, compare it to the rest of the world as well. So, yeah, let's check this out. Aircraft carriers are so important They're to the US government well. that there is a federal law mandating the minimum number of operational carriers that the US Navy must have. That really? number is 11. But how did they come up with this number? And why is there so much emphasis on aircraft carriers and not on other types of ships? The number of aircraft carriers, the size of the US Navy, and the size of the US military as a whole all follow a simple formula that's based on two major wars. But Interesting. it's not what you think. Being they, the most powerful... They need the aircraft carriers because US are on the other side of the world, right? So, well, to most countries, right? So... For them to like go to war and stuff or you know do whatever they need to do they gotta take an aircraft carrier so 11 but what why is that because number is not the same thing as being powerful enough they're badass you often hear that the united states has the largest and most powerful yeah. navy in the world but just being number one is not necessarily sufficient just like how any mma champion they need would to be, be overboard overwhelmed if they face multiple opponents at once the most powerful military may also not be able to defeat the combined forces of multiple right. nations. So the question is, how much power is enough? Oh, have they got 11 to distribute to different like countries? They probably have, right? The United States military doctrine At is based around power projection. Power projection, simply put, is the ability of a country to deploy and sustain forces outside of their territory. To accommodate this, there are currently about 750 U.S. foreign military bases spread across 80 nations around the world. 750 U.S. bases across 70 or 80, uh, I've forgotten the number already, countries in the world, man. But the United that States' crazy. primary means of power projection, especially where permanent basing is limited, is the Navy. And this is precisely why there is so much emphasis on aircraft carriers. Where is the closest aircraft carrier? They say that's the first question that US presidents ask at the time of a crisis. But it's really the air wing assigned to the aircraft carrier that the presidents are interested in. The carrier uh, is just a floating airbase. Yeah, the primary it's what's role on of it. any aircraft carrier is to enable operation of the air wing that it carries. Kind of like how bread is just a vehicle for delivering <laughs> butter. And the true power projection that aircraft carriers are known for is really enabled by the airplanes in the carrier air wing, which can project tactical air power over long distances, including airborne early warning, air interdiction, and air-to-surface warfare. In fact, the same law that currently demands the US Navy to have a minimum of 11 aircraft carriers also requires a minimum of 9 carrier air wings. Right, how okay. did the US government <gasps> come up with the number 11? So it's always ready. The US Navy's 11 supercarriers are more than all other nations aircraft carriers combined. Huh? And that's just in quantity. Wait. This all other nations. The US Navy's 11 supercarriers are more than all other nations aircraft carriers combined. Wait, so the US Navy has 11 super aircraft carriers and that's more than the whole entire world com Huh? Is there and not many in the world, in Displacement aside, the American aircraft carriers are all nuclear-powered, giving them unlimited range. But not all 11 supercarriers are deployable simultaneously. At any given time, Look about a third are in Jesus. maintenance yards dealing with upgrades and overhauls, a third are undergoing training and preparation, and a third are on deployment. Even though, if needed, more carriers could be rushed into deployment, the total number of deployable supercarriers is far from the nominal 11. Right. In practice, two to three supercarriers are deployed at any given time, right. and that is enough. Enough to fight two wars in two separate regions of the world at once and decisively win both. Wait, these aircraft carriers, man, they must be... Like, I can see they're massive, but... You, you, could, you could win two wars at two different times with just two to three under president lyndon b johnson the u.s armed forces were yeah, sized that to good. be able to fight two wars at the same time right. at some point even a half war was added to be fought in the third world 
when Nixon took office in 1969, the formula was changed to accommodate fighting one and a half wars simultaneously. Each president after that somewhat modified this strategy. But the basic measure still seems to be defined as the ability to fight in two geographically separated regions of the world nearly simultaneously. This is the thing, man. This is why America is just number one ranked, so powerful, etc. Superpower. Because how are you going to fight a country when their military strategy plan is to fight two wars at once. Like, you're going there wanting to fight one war. You're going to put everything into the one war. Whilst they're there going, yo, we're, we're planning to fight two wars at one time, man. You know what I mean? Like, how? This is referred to as two major regional contingencies strategy or two major theater wars strategy. The ability to deter and defeat large-scale cross-border aggression in two distant theaters in overlapping Jesus. time frames is key for the United States to remain a global power and maintain its worldwide interests. The most recent example of this strategy in action is the two overlapping major wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Hi. The Iraq war started in 2003, overthrowing Saddam Hussein and the official withdrawal of U.S. troops was completed in 2011. Although the mismanagement of the power vacuum following Saddam's demise gave prominence to ISIS in 2014, followed by the reinvolvement of U.S. troops. In parallel, the war in Afghanistan started in 2001 and went on for 20 years. Um... In February of 2020, the U.S. and Taliban signed an agreement in Qatar where Taliban agreed to take unspecified action to prevent other groups, including Al-Qaeda, from using Afghan soil to threaten the U.S. and its allies, in return for full withdrawal of all international forces from Afghanistan. Wow, interesting. By August 31st, 2021, as the whole world was watching, the U.S. and allied forces had hastily departed from Kabul, putting the Taliban back in control of the country. But this idea of fighting two wars at once goes back to the late 19th and early 20th century. The late 19th century was a time of territorial expansion for the United States. In 1898 alone, the United States annexed Hawaii, acquired Guam and Puerto Rico, and purchased the Philippines from Spain for $20 million. Imagine! Right, listen, the Philippines is stunning. It's so beautiful. Imagine, I know, I know $20 million back then was a lot now, but like way more now. But imagine buying the Philippines, the whole entire Philippines for $20 million, man. With oh, some of those my. islands being in the Pacific. I don't have $20 million to buy Atlantic, it, but I'd find it somehow. presence was required in both oceans. The completion of the Panama right. Canal in 1914 allowed the crossing of ships from one side to the other which meant the U.S. Navy could be present in both oceans without having twice as many ships. But by the 1930s, with the rise of new regional powers to the West and the decline of the Royal Navy to protect the United States against threats from the East, it became necessary for defense planners to consider the possibility of confronting two threats simultaneously, from Germany on the East and from Japan on the West. Wow. The result was the 1940 Vincent Walsh Act, also known as the Two Ocean Navy Act, which funded a 70% increase in the size of the U.S. Navy fleet. This was the largest naval procurement bill in U.S. history, authorizing $8.5 billion at a time for a naval expansion program that put emphasis on aircraft and aircraft carriers. It's a lot of money. This resulted in the construction of 18 aircraft carriers and expansion of air and naval facilities across the Pacific. Now, it's one thing to come up with a concept or strategy, like one that allows for fighting and winning two major wars simultaneously. But it's a whole other thing to actually come up with the numbers. Right. How many army divisions, how many Air Force fighter wings, and how many Navy carrier strike groups? Look at that, man. Listen, I'm telling you right now, if I ever see that coming towards me, I am gone. I'm going the other direction. I'm swimming. I might even swap my, my, my military kit, my military badge. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm switching, man. Required to support I'm switching. Such a strategy. And within each one, say the Navy, how many and what types of ships are exactly needed? The U.S. Navy's goal is to reach 355 ships by 2034. 
Currently, they have 298, and at the rate that they're going, retiring two-year-old ships, it's debatable that they'll hit that goal. I got a question, right? For you guys to answer in the comment section. These Navy numbers are a lot for Navy numbers, but really low in my sense of like, can't the people on the ground who they're attacking blow up these ships with missiles? Or is it a lot harder than that? Because like, let's say you see two aircraft, aircraft carriers coming at you. It's a big target. If you send a couple missiles over at it, blow it up, sink it. It's a lot of damage. It's a lot of damage. You could turn two to zero. Or is it, have they got a lot of equipment to stop that? Interesting. Remember that aircraft carriers are vulnerable on their own, which is why they never sail alone. A variety okay. of ships are needed to support the carriers when deployed, which is why Navy ships like cruisers, right. destroyers, and at times submarines and supply ships accompany carriers in a formation known as a carrier strike group. Aye, so they've got a nice little formation going on to protect the carrier, right, obviously. But like, are they even a e equipped with stuff to shoot down missiles or to stop missiles? Because like, missiles are pretty, like, I know you can shoot down missiles, but what if they send, what if they send loads? But conservative public policy organizations, it's probably a lot harder. studies done by the Heritage Foundation, it's probably really hard to shoot down. a much bigger military. For example, not a 355 ship navy, but a 400 ship navy, and not 11 aircraft carriers. But 13, I mean 12 plus 1. Huh? The 1 accounts for a carrier that is almost always undergoing extensive midlife overhaul. The rationale for wanting the other 12 aircraft carriers is to maintain one aircraft carrier at each of the three major regions of the world. Right. Atlantic, Pacific, and the Mediterranean slash Middle East. Wow, they want to, okay. Then to have three additional aircraft carriers for each carrier deployed. This is to ensure that the ships, the crew, and the aircraft on board can remain healthy and effective. Less ships could mean longer deployment times, which may not be operationally realistic. The 340-day deployment of USS Nimitz, which ended in March of 2021, Look at that, was man. the longest deployment of any aircraft carrier since the Vietnam War. Even how do you even, proponent... how do you even park that there? Like the, the <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, I'm actually sure gonna park my car. How is he parking that there? The two major theater wars strategy insists that no one has been able to come up with a better and more robust solution for sizing the U.S. military. There are massive costs associated with maintaining and growing an even Crazy. bigger military force. Something that has proven difficult given that U.S. military budget as a percentage of the GDP has been declining over the past few decades. Oh, really? In addition, other forms of threats like cyber warfare could throw a big wrench into the mix. Cyber attacks that can cause widespread disruption to communication systems in the United States or even yeah. worse, in military command control and communication systems could have devastating consequences to U.S. national security. Hey, listen, listen, this is all good and all, but like in, in 24 years, you want to get these shits, but in 24 years, it's going to be cyber attacks and robot attacks, right? How are you going to be, how are you going to be stopping the Terminator flying up in the sky, coming straight down, dodging every single missile you're sending at him, every single rocket, straight into the aircraft carrier, destroys the aircraft carrier, comes back up and just, you know, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> what's going to happen there, bro? They'll have their the own robots, to be fair. 1940 a robot was written at defender. A time when power projection required physical presence, aircraft carriers, and aviators. That's why we love Top Gun. But would a day come when Tom Cruise stars in Top Hack? <laughs> right, really good video though. Enjoyed that. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it as well. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section on the question I asked on just anything in general, the military itself. Hopefully you guys did enjoy this video. If you did, make sure to leave a thumbs up, subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next video. Peace.